We have CEO Everett Taylor speaking with Brian Heater. Please welcome them to the stage. It's always a crapshoot having the last panel of the day, but this is, this is pretty good. I'm feeling pretty, pretty good, good about this crowd. There's like a slight mass exodus, but I uh, appreciate they don't know what everybody missing. rocking with us. Yeah, awesome. for sure. Well, Everett, thanks for doing this. Uh, you and I talked for the first time, I think the day or shortly after your role was announced, which was almost like year to the day. Almost, yeah. From right now. So yeah. this is kind of a perfect opportunity to take stock and reflect on the last year. I'm going to ask you the same first question that I asked you last time. You know, when, when you came on board, Kickstarter was having some troubles. Yep. Probably not an easy job. I mean, being CEO is never easy, but particularly in that instance, why'd you take the job? Well, first of all, if it was easy, I probably wouldn't have got the okay. job in the first place. Um, but secondly, um, I've gotten to this point in my life where um, I'm driven by impact more than anything. Hmm. And um, I'm not proud to say, like, I've made decisions in my career that maybe I wasn't the most aligned with or most passionate about um, because there's this kind of rat race to, like, you know, move up and sure. elevate in your career and make more money. And, you know, coming from where I come from, um, it was really important for me to get, you know, financial security. But I was fortunate to be in a space in my life where, you know, I could really pick the things that I'm genuinely passionate about. Before I was at Artsy, I was genuinely passionate about democratizing the art world. And when, it, when I look at a company like Kickstarter, I don't think there's a company that exists out there that has the positive impact and the amount of lives that we do on a year-to-year -year basis or, or in, in the lifespan of the company. And to be able to get up every day and be able to um, do something that I actually felt like I was doing something positive in this in this world it was just too good to turn um, pass up. So when you say democratizing, are you referring to access primarily? Yeah, uh, access, education, all of those things. You know, the art world um, is a space that is very much run by the elite. Um, it's uh, typically very inaccessible. It's also usually very white. And so for me to get into that space and to do things like I remember when I went to Artsy. You know, the majority of our top artists, like our top 100 artists, was majority white men. By the time I left, most of those people were women and people of color that were the top artists that are, were desired on the platform. Um, and there's a lot of ways to go about that, from technology to content to marketing and brand. Um, but to be intentional in that was really, really important to me. In the same case as it was at Kickstarter when I came in, there was a lack of diversity in the team. There was also a lack of diversity in the creators that were being successful on the platform. And that's why I'm proud about the progress that we've made this year. That's interesting. I, I did want to ask you a question because I know uh, diversity has been, you know, probably at the top of your list when you came on. It's, it's one thing to make a more diverse team. Obviously, you know, you're directly in charge of the hiring. How do you go about that on the creator side? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, first of all, having a diverse team also inspires people to be on the platform. I can't tell you the amount of new creators we've had on, this, on the platform, from people of color to women to people of all different backgrounds that have reached out and said, I launched on Kickstarter because you're there and I see your leadership and you care about us and you, you care about our stories, you care about the smaller creators as well as the big creators. And so I think having people there that they see people are in the company that reflect them and reflect their stories and I think that's really important for people. But on the flip side is really thinking about from one, a product standpoint, it's like when you're building products, are you keeping people in mind that come from all different walks of life and backgrounds? That's something that a lot of people don't do. And that's something that I, you know, I'm really uh, proud of the team for building products and features. And we've, we've launched so many great products and features this year that is leveling the playing field for all different types of people and not just the elite creators. Um, and then on the other side is the marketing side. And that's what I'm, what I'm really excited about in year two. We've made some really incredible marketing hires and really getting the brand out there and getting our, ourselves in spaces that we haven't typically been in. Like we're about to be one of the big sponsors in activating at CultureCon, which is um, probably the biggest conference uh, for people of color and mm. creatives of color in New York. And you know, being in spaces like that, that Kickstarter typically wasn't in, is gonna definitely have a great impact. 
I want to get a little granular on that. Uh, when you talk about features that, that, uh, that increase diversity, like specific, what are some examples? So one of the things that, for instance, that we're working on right now is something um, with creator education, right? So a lot of people, when they come onto Kickstarter, they don't know what they're doing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of people that haven't had the resources or the, the, you know, the knowledge or people that have done Kickstarters before can't tell them something as simple, how to set a goal. One of the things that, like, eats yeah. at me is like people not sell, setting realistic goals for their Kickstarter. Like I saw someone that, you know, only needed like 15,000 uh, 50, for like a documentary or something short that they were trying to make, but they had a goal of like 2.5 million. I, I, um, I talked to somebody about this recently, yeah. a company that, that uh, they're actually uh, here this week that launched on Kickstarter and they said, you know, th this was our public goal and this was our internal goal. Yes. Which, is, is that pretty common? Yes, for people that know what they're doing, okay. right? People who are working with agencies, people who um, are in the know or have the, the business savvy to know how to do those things, but um, not everyone has access to it. Like when I was growing up in Southside Richmond, I didn't have access to those types of things and knew how to launch something like a Kickstarter before. And so being able to put those, those educational materials in the hands of creators is extremely important. Um, launching things like you know, uh, a, a brand new text editor for people that aren't as tech savvy, knowing how to create their projects and things like that. Mm -hmm. These things go a long way. We're doing a lot in terms of um, matchmaking. So there's a lot of creators that come onto our platform that don't have built-in audiences already. That's one of the hardest parts of Kickstarter is like, if you don't have an audience or you don't have somebody that you can really, uh, an audience that you can tap into, it makes it really, really harder. And so we're doing a lot to build features and, and matchmaking features for people for, um, if you have a great idea and a great product, I want you to be successful on the platform no matter what your background may be. So we're, we're here on the hardware stage, so ostensibly we're talking about hardware. It's obviously uh, a big part of what you do at Kickstarter. Looking at the hardware landscape, do you think that hardware has a diversity problem? Does it have a diversity problem? I think it has in uh, a resource problem, right? Like it has a problem of like, I think there's a lot of diversity of people that want to do things in the hardware space, but the amount of people that actually have the resources to make those things happen, I think is a lot slimmer. And so um, people need to see that it's possible. Mm. And I don't think a lot of people of color and people from diverse backgrounds have seen it be possible. So I think there's people that are interested in the space, but seeing that it's actually possible for them, I think there is a lack of diversity of people that feel like they have the opportunity to do so. So you, you came on during the pandemic. The, you, the, the New York office has actually since uh, closed. Um, kind of. Kind of? Okay. Yeah, I, I use it from time to time. Yeah, yeah. okay. But there, there aren't as many people there, and um, the team, as far as I know, is still, uh, everyone is still able to work remotely if they want to. Yes. Uh, did you consider forcing people to come back to the office? <laughs> Trying to get me in trouble and sound like you on some. It's my job. You know, um, no, I'm just messing with you, <laughs> B. Um, you know, it, when you come into a new company and like you're like, man, I see all these people on the Zoom screen and I don't have, I don't get an opportunity to interact with them. You, you think all types of ideas uh, cross your mind, and we have like the sickest office. Like, no shade to anybody's office, but it's not as fly as Kickstarters, I promise you. Um, and so when I, when I got to spend time and I was like, man, how amazing would it be to have everybody up in here, you know, creating, ideating, you hadn't collaborating. Because I, I didn't get to experience that. Um, but ultimately, you know, I want to do what's best for the people. You know, we are a public benefit corporation. You know, you know, although we're the biggest in our space, we care so much about impact and doing the right thing for people. And our workforce has been happier. Engagement has gone up being in a remote environment. And so for me, if that's what we need to keep our employees happy and in a good in a good mind space. And we still have satellite offices for people that need physical spaces. Um, but you know, I want to make sure that we're people first in our approach. I suspect to a certain extent this is hard for you to gauge because, again, you started like, like a couple years into the pandemic, but what is your sense broadly of how the pandemic has impacted crowdfunding? That's a really interesting question. I think 
from the fulfillment side, I think a lot of people ran into a lot of hurdles, especially with shipping and unexpected costs and, and, and the, the rise in prices of certain things that were, especially in hardware, right? Um, that people weren't um, expecting the cost of materials, et cetera, et cetera. I think that genuinely impacted the fulfillment for a lot of different projects, unfortunately. I think also um, the, there was like a, a boom in crowdfunding yeah. during the pandemic as well as people are looking for like alternatives and that boom has sustained as the world around us is like completely on tilt whether it's the the music industry or the film industry um the automobile industry like things around us are completely changing and so it was great to see that momentum sustain where i think a lot of companies had this momentum during the pandemic where they saw things spike where as kickstarter we've been able to keep up some of that momentum just because the world is becoming you know more about the creator economy i think it's crazy that no one talks about kickstarter in the creator economy but mm. there's i don't think there's any company if you look at patreon or any other company that is really impacting uh, creators in the way that Kickstarter is in the creator economy. And I think now with the world and the way that it's changed, I mean, you know, I'm sure there's somebody in this audience that's been affected by layoffs. Like there's, it's like we have to go into survival mode. And I think Kickstarter has given people an opportunity that's like, yo, I'm not going to depend on this tech company to, for my employment. I'm not going to depend on this or this record label. I'm not going to, you know, rely on this VC funding. We saw y'all funding black people and then y'all pulled back. So we got more alternatives now and Kickstarter is one of those. And so I think the landscape of the world has, has really helped continue that momentum there. Yeah, I, I suspect a big part of the reason why people don't frame Kickstarter that way is because they, they tend to think of it as this place where, where you raise money and then you raise money and then go off and, and do your thing yeah. and maybe you do another product and you raise money later. Uh, what can Kickstarter do for people in between those things? Yeah, I mean, first you can't lack imagination, you know, like, um, and I think for people to understand that, you know, Kickstarter is an idea. It's very abstract. And it doesn't matter if you're a super successful filmmaker or you're not. You, or, you know, we've had companies that, you know, who have gone public or, you know, worth billions of dollars, launch new products on a platform. We've had people that don't have any money and are launching things out of their garage, right? And so Kickstarter has to be seen as a place where people love new ideas and new creation. It doesn't matter where you are in the life cycle of where you are in your life or your company or your brand, that Kickstarter is a platform for that. People have built real audiences um, on the platform that they continue to tap back into. And so to me, it's like, I think a lot of people try to put a ceiling on Kickstarter and they don't have to. Your predecessor received some feedback for his decision to not voluntarily recognize the union. Yeah. What, now that there is a Kickstarter union and now that you're the boss, what is your relationship? Those are the homies, man, yeah. you know? Um, I was actually, I had a call with one of our union stewards today. Um, they're just people, man. Like, people try to make unions as, like, the big bad wolf. These are just, these are my colleagues. These are my friends. These are people that just want to be treated with respect. You know, we've seen what's happened in the tech industry this year and in, in, in the past year and how people have lost their jobs, lost their livelihood, things like that. People in the union just want protection to not have terrible things happen to them and just have basic rights um, as employees from their employer. And so to me, there isn't, there isn't any issues. We've had a really peaceful year and, um, you know, we've had such a productive year, like from a product product standpoint, we've released more features already this year than we did all of last year. Um, and so we're, we're productive, people are engaged, people are in a good place, and like, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. There, there haven't been any places where you don't quite see eye to eye with the union? I don't think there's any places that we don't see quite eye to eye with the union at all, to be honest. Like, the, everyone's very mission aligned, everyone wants the same things, and I think both sides just want each side to be treated well. And I think we're in agreement with that. Yeah. You, you sort of alluded to, uh, to layoffs and, you know, before you came on, there were some layoffs at Kickstarter. Yeah. I, will there be any more in the foreseeable future or do you feel like you're in a pretty uh, solid footing? That's a hell no. Okay. You can quote that. Um, no, there, there. It's hell no to layoffs, not hell no to solid footing. 
Uh, oh, we're a solid footing, yeah. Hell no to, hell no to. This is what you want to clarify for that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, no, we're not going to do any layoffs anytime soon. Kickstarter is in a really, really solid, pl solid place. Um, for you guys who know Kickstarter's history, Kickstarter has been profitable since year two, you know, and so that wasn't the cause for the layoffs. It was just the unpredictable nature of the pandemic. Yeah. Like, you know, with everything, the world literally slowed and shut down. Um, and I think it's always interesting when, like, people like really zoom in on Kickstarter and like the layoffs that it had in 2020. And I'm like, yo, these tech companies have had hella layoffs sure. round and round and round every year. 17,000. Uh, yeah, 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 it's insane. So to us, it was like one small layoff in 2020. And we haven't had that since. And, you know, we've, we've been growing and progressing since then. And that's why I'm here, because I want to give more new stories. I want new things to talk about, new creators, you know, like Andre over here at Revolve, who's doing incredible things with his wheelchair. Like, we have so many incredible new stories to share and positive stories to share that that's what I want in a new cycle now. Is, do we, we have a bunch of creators up front here? Oh, I know. I'm, I met I'm with looking Andre at, yeah. earlier. Are, yeah, were yeah, you yeah, on yeah. Kickstarter? One year ago. What's man. the company name? Dope, man. Cool, awesome. man. Twelve years. Oh, wow. Wow. Through, through crowdfunding. That's great. I love it. Um, so, so, I mean, you want to tell the sort of the good news story. Is Kickstarter hiring currently? Yeah, Kickstarter is hiring. Which, or, I mean, We've, we've increased, I don't know what the percentage of employees this year, but we're hiring, we're hiring new roles, especially on the tech and product side. Um, I'm really excited for 2024 and 2025 and the roadmap that we have and the things that we're um, coming with and like really focusing on, you know, two, two major things is like really end to end creator support, like really helping creators throughout the life cycle of their creator journey. Like, Currently, you know, Kickstarter is really like, hey, you go and you raise money and then like, all right, good yeah. luck. Yeah. Or, you know, there's an ideation and there's a whole side. I was talking to the creator earlier who was like, I started this in 2015 and mm. they're just launching it, and, you know, in 2023. So there's a whole process that goes along with that. And so I want to support that more. And then also on the backer side, it's like, let's continue to build audiences on the platform, ready-made audiences for our creators as well. So on the uh, community front, what, what's the status of the blockchain project? Is that, is that gone? It's, it's not gone. It's just in a discovery phase. It's very separate from the core company. It's, this is a whole other entity. So people think that Kickstarter is on the blockchain. Kickstarter is not on the blockchain. There's no plans for us to be on the blockchain. Like This is a completely separate entity that is exploring how blockchain technology can be potentially helpful to crowdfunding, but we haven't touched blockchain ourselves. Again, obviously this, this predates you, but you know, there was a big pushback online. Yeah. Were, there any, were there any big lessons learned from that experience? Uh, talk to your users. Okay. <laughs> talk, to, talk to your users. Yeah. You might want to get some feedback before making such a big, you know, big move in that, and I think that's another problem when things come top down. Right? Like when, when decisions are made top down and um, you know, you're not talking to your users and like you don't have alignment, then sometimes decisions like that are, are being made and how it was rolled out wasn't the right way. And so you know, we, I've tried to do my best to remedy that in our first interview. You know, I, I really had a very firm stance and, and, and that stance has continued. Yeah, I don't want to make your inbox any, any more crowded than it is right now. I'm sure yeah. yours is even worse than mine. But you know, I, I talk to a lot of people launching on Kickstarter. Uh, a lot of them are excited, you know, that you're on. There's a, there's a new leader. There's a new direction. How, how can they reach out to you? E at kickstarter.com. Okay. Yeah, Fair it's enough. very simple. Yeah. Uh, something that we also, getting back to that other interview that we talked about that I'm sure you get all the time, but is an important question. A lot of people have this history of backing something the, you know, they, they sign up for a certain level, they sign up for the product, the product doesn't come. You and I both know, it, you know it's not a shopping site, yep. it's not a pre-order site, but that's going to sour you yep. to Kickstarter going forward. Yep. How do you bring them back? Oh man, I got some plan. Um, <laughs> so first and foremost, like, I want to apologize. If you've ever you know, supported a Kickstarter, by the way, 
like the the fact that like only 10%, I think it's actually less than 10% of Kickstarters actually do not fulfill. So think about that. These are like the craziest, yeah. newest ideas and over 90% of them actually happen and come to fruition, right? But the one thing I've learned is like, it's kind of like the Yelp rule. Like you can go somewhere and like everyone has all these great experience and then you have that one great experience, uh, that one bad experience and then you want to write a, write a bad review. And so that's kind of the problem that Kickstarter has is that yes, the loudest people are the people that don't get what they, yeah. what they wanted. But at the end of the day, we're not a marketplace. We're not an e-commerce site. Like you're, in, you're, you're supporting people's dreams. You're supporting things that you're interested in. But it says very explicitly, like this is not, you know, this is not an e-commerce platform. So there is risk in any time that you um, support a Kickstarter. But with that being said, I do not think Kickstarter has done a great job of holding people accountable, because you know, in the very, very rare case where there's actual fraud. Then, but Kickstarter hasn't taken that next step to hold those people accountable. And trust me, I'm about to lay down the law, man. We got some stuff coming um, on the legal side and on the product side as well, um, on the trust and safety side, which I'm really, really excited about. And then the, the stuff that really excites me is on the product side, being able to predict uh, fulfillment risk, mm. to be able to do things to help uh, creators who are running into issues more like we can do so so much more and I will say this for the creators that don't fulfill most of the time it's just they ran into something that they could have never predicted you know this is their first time doing something it's not nefarious or fraud but there is you know a very very small percentage of people who are doing nefarious things so that's super interesting how do you calculate the risk rate or the I guess the the odds of delivery yeah, I think there's like I think there's signs, right? I think there's signs um, that we can tap into where, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. It's about to be 15 years, and from what I've spoken to from my product and engineering teams, there are different signs that you can see where there's okay, this is this is starting to become a little bit more risky, and I want to be able to inform our backers about that um, ahead of time and be able to do more to support the creators to say, hey. Look, if you're running into issues, like let us help you, let us support you um, in the in, in your endeavors, and so not run away. So if you're a creator here and you're running into an issue, don't ghost backers. Like do you know communicate and communicate with us. We just want to help. Yeah. So there, there's a certain level of vetting that happens on the top. Obviously, not everybody who applies uh, gets into Kickstarter, and and it sounds like you're talking about continuing to monitor that throughout the process. Yes. Yes, not just from the top, but throughout the entire journey, but also giving people the resources to actually be successful. A lot of these people has, have never done this shit before. Like, think about that. Like, this, I think doing a Kickstarter is one of the scariest things. Like, you're really putting yourself out there. You have a dream, you have an aspiration, you're trying to make it come true, and you might not have ever done anything like before. You never may have worked with manufacturers out in China or whatever that may be. And so I think for a lot of times, it's the first time. And that's why, you know, when you work with, you know, some of these pre launch services like Launch Boom and et cetera, et cetera, it's really helpful for these creators because they may not have that experience. What are your thoughts on equity crowdfunding? We don't do it. <laughs> we don't do it. I mean, look, that's not our hustle, man. Yeah. Like, you know, that's not our space. But like, I think, get it how you live. You know, that's what, what we say where I'm from. Like, whatever you got to do to make your dream come true, if you want to do, you know, equity crowdfunding, like, more power to you. I just know on Kickstarter, we're not taking a percentage of, no one's taking a percentage of your company. I would rather mm -hmm. crowdfund and keep 100% of my company than crowdfund and then lose a piece of my company. When you and I talked to earlier, we talked a little bit about Indiegogo, and I think you said one of the things that you thought they've done really well is address the Chinese market. Yep. Um, from an international perspective, what does the future look like for Kickstarter? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're going to invest more into the international market. There's also still a ton of markets that we're not in. Like, whenever I see my African friends, they're like, yo, dude. You know, so yeah. uh, we definitely want to expand, but it takes time. You know, these things take time, and we want to make sure that we enter into new markets and things like that. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, like, yeah, there's markets like China that are super important. There's other markets that are super important, like India, which we're not in. Yeah. Yeah. Extremely important, but that's a very complicated 
country to go into as well. And so we want to make sure that we're doing it right. And so all those things are things that I want to do. Um, and I think it's really important to really scale our impact and help people from all around the world. But it's going to be in a piecemeal way. Uh, I'm afraid to say that we're out of time now. Yeah, but man. Everett, this is great. Thanks so much. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. Thank you.